Newton's second law gives us the prescription for solving all of the problems of classical mechanics. Here on the left-hand side, the net force, a vector sum, of all of the influence, all of the constraints and conditions that could possibly influence the motion of a system are to be considered. And if I consider that appropriately, then that is in fact equal to the total mass of the system um, proportional to the acceleration, or not the mass proportional to the acceleration, but the acceleration proportional to the mass. And so the challenge for me is to look at any system or situation that I'd like to analyze very carefully and to see if I can reason out what these influences are. I have to get them organized in such a way that I can perform this vector sum or Newton's second law is useless to me. In our physics, the way that we organize our forces is by drawing what's known as a free body diagram. I'm not terribly sure about the name. What it's always meant to me is that I need to draw a diagram of forces where I free the body from the context of the physical situation that it's in and consider only the forces that influence its motion. For my purposes today, I just need some example that I can work on that has all of the features that I need or that I would like to instruct about. And so what I choose to do is to imagine a situation where I have here a cart that is drawn by a horse. You see there are some details to it. The cart, of course, has a wheel, which means it has an axle and all sorts of little parts and details there. And there's something in the cart, um, some sort of uh, straw, I suppose, or something. And then uh, the cart is connected to the horse by means of uh, a yoke, which has some, itself has some parts to it and the ways that it's connected. And then the horse, naturally horses have fantastic amount of biological detail to them. So what I want to do is understand the motion of the cart and the horse in the context of Newton's second law. Now Newton's second law provides me with the acceleration of the system. And so what do I mean in this context? Well, there are really four states of motion that I could discover and describe using Newton's second law. Four distinct states of motion. That is the first being at rest. The cart and the horse could be sitting on the road, not moving. They could be stationary. And therefore, their acceleration is equal to zero. But that is not the only state of motion for which the acceleration is zero. It's also possible that the cart and horse could be moving along at constant velocity. When they move together at constant velocity, the acceleration is in fact equal to zero. Uh, so that makes that motion, according to Newton's second law, uh, in, in the analysis, identical to rest. Naturally, the cart and the horse could be accelerating. If I choose to the right to be the positive direction, as I commonly do, then a positive acceleration with a positive velocity means that the cart and the horse would be speeding up. Once attaining some velocity, it's possible that the cart and the horse could slow down. In fact, necessary at some point to slow to a stop. And in that case, if the cart is moving in the positive direction, it has a negative acceleration. So there are really four states of motion. Rest, motion with constant velocity, motion with positive acceleration, and motion with negative acceleration. Newton's second law gives me the answer to all states of motion with one analysis. And if I analyze the system properly, I should be able to describe all of those conditions in the context of my analysis. But I'll have to find a way to be very careful about drawing the influences on the system. The system that I've chosen here has two distinct parts, a cart and a horse. If I presume that the cart and the horse are always going to move together with the same velocity, that means if their velocity changes, it changes by the same amount in the same interval of time, and that means that the cart and the horse have the same acceleration. Now, that's how I'm going to do things today. It's certainly not necessarily true. It's possible that the cart could, or the horse could take off with uh, such vigor that the cart and the horse separate one from the other, that the horse has a larger acceleration than the cart, and the cart and the horse part ways. That's certainly a thing that could happen, but it's not going to be part of my analysis here. It's also true that the, perhaps um, the horse gets the cart going entirely too fast, and the cart unfortunately overtakes the horse, in which case the cart's acceleration might be larger than the horse's acceleration, and the cart ends up on top of the horse, heaven forbid. That also is not part of my analysis here. I'm going to presume, for the purposes of this discussion, that the cart and the horse move together as one object. And the advantage there is that I can essentially analyze this system three times. I can write a Newton's second law analysis for the cart, considering only those forces which influence the motion of the cart. I can write an analysis for the horse, considering only those forces which influence the motion of the horse. Or I can consider the horse and the cart together as if they're one object. So I choose to do all three of those things. I'll start with my analysis of the motion of the cart. 
To analyze the motion of the cart, I'm going to draw a box here labeled C that represents the box or the cart is represented by a box. The cart represented, damn it, the cart represented here by a box. You see, I have freed the cart from its context and I have removed all of the details which I choose not to consider. As I mentioned, the cart has a wheel and the wheel has an axle and it has parts and bolts that hold the whole thing together. The cart is made of wood. The wood is connected with nails and all these things. And there is a, um, a load in the cart. Uh, and so all of these things, I do not need to consider them all because I'm going to consider that when the cart moves, everything in the cart moves with the same acceleration. That is not explicitly true, by the way. If I analyze the motion of the cart and the motion of the wheels of the cart, there's a way in which we will describe later in our physics that they do not have the same acceleration. That a rotating wheel has a different kind of acceleration, perhaps, and might be considered independently. But for the moment, I'll imagine that all of the cart oh, and everything that is cart moves along. And so all I need to describe it is this box here, labeled C. And now what I want to do with this box is I want to draw on this box all of the forces that influence the motion of the cart. I must be careful here. I do not want to exert, to draw on my diagram forces that the cart exerts elsewhere. For example, I might uh, imagine that the cart is pulling backward on the horse. Well, that will in fact turn out to be true, but the cart exerts forces on the horse that influence the motion of the horse. On my free body diagram for the cart, I want to draw only those forces that influence the motion of the cart. And so I begin. When I first introduced the idea of forces, I made a list, a general list of forces that I might expect to appear. It was not an all-inclusive list. It was sort of a guide to looking at systems and thinking about the kind of forces that I might see. First force on that list of forces was the weight. Because when I do physics near the surface of the Earth, the presence of the Earth causes gravitational force which can be relied upon. To have a strength that I, can, that I, that I know how to calculate, the force of gravity on an ob object is simply its mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, g, um, wherever you, whatever location you happen to be. And I also know that that gravitational force, known as the weight, points directly downward, radially towards the center of the Earth. So what I'll do here on my free body diagram is I'll draw an arrow directed downward, radially towards the center of the Earth, and I'll label it with the weight of the cart. You'll notice here that I do not use w to stand for the weight. That's because I have a much more important and I suppose in a way perhaps more fundamental use for the weight later on in my physics. So what I'll do anytime I want to describe the weight is I'll just write mg the way that you calculated. That's how I'll describe it. But here notice that I've used the mass of the cart mc. It's really important that I do that because in my analysis in this particular case there is more than one object. If there's more than one object, that means there's more than one mass, and it means I might become confused. Uh, in my algebra, if I just call every mass that I see mass, I can get into some trouble that way. So I'll try to be very careful to give things unique names. I'll never go wrong over labeling things, but if I under label, I can get myself into some serious trouble. So here's the mass of the cart times g, and I draw an arrow straight down. There are some different schools of thought on how to draw the arrows. I have seen free body diagrams drawn so that the arrows point toward the object. That is, the weight would be drawn as an arrow above pointing toward uh, the cart or the box that represents the cart. I don't like that at all. So there's a certain kind of style going on here. There are also free body diagrams that you'll see where the arrows that are drawn try to give you a feel for the relative magnitude of the forces. I've never found that a useful thing to do, and I always found myself worrying about the length of the, and how, they, how precisely they describe the magnitudes. So all I'm looking to do here is to provide myself with an indication of the presence of the force and the direction that the force acts on the object. So I have the weight force acting down. The next thing on my list of forces to look for was push-pull forces, forces whose nature is not exactly known, but I'm aware of their presence because of the context of what's happening. Well, certainly the horse is pulling on the cart. That's the whole point, is that the horse would pull um, the cart along the ground here. 
So I'll draw a force on my free body diagram directed to the right to indicate the influence of the force to the right, which is the direction I'm presuming the motion is going to be. And I'll call it F sub H, capital F, because it's just a force that I don't have an equation for. I don't know its fundamental nature. But subscript H, because I know that that force is provided by the horse. This is a choice that I make. It's not a rule of physics, just a style of how I do my free body diagram to make sure that I know what I'm talking about when later on when this free body diagram becomes an equation and I begin to manipulate it algebraically. The next thing on my list of forces was the tension exerted by a rope. Now you might look at this and say, well, yeah, maybe there's a rope that attaches the horse uh, to the cart. You have to be careful there because I'm either going to call, if there were a rope attached, if the cart is actually a rope uh, to, from between the cart and the horse, I might say, well, is it a tension or is it a push-pull? It doesn't matter which one you call it because there's not, ex there's not precise rules going on here about how I should do this. But the important thing is that I should not count the influence of the horse twice. So what I've done here is I've counted the influence of the horse in, the, in, the, in FH here. I don't need to add a tension force because I imagine there are some details. Those details um, don't particularly matter. The importance to the, to the motion is that the horse influences the cart. Next on my list was forces of contact. Now, I had said that any time any two surfaces are in contact, that there exists a force between the two, the nature of which is electrodynamic uh, and repulsive. Normal force, because the word normal means perpendicular. And so I draw on my free body diagram a force directed upward because the cart sits on the ground and the ground pushes upward on the cart. It is true that the cart pushes downward on the ground. You'll know this as soon as the cart runs you over, perhaps stops and sits on top of you. The cart exerts a force downward uh, on the ground, but that's not the force that I want on my free body diagram. I want the force exerted on the cart. So I draw the normal force on the cart directed upward. Next on my list was a friction force. And a point here is that um, there are some problems that you can solve where they say that the system is frictionless. Well, that's not a real thing because there are, there are very, very few situations uh, in nature that can be described as frictionless. Uh, very, 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 very few. So any real situations that I encounter, sort of a general rule I should have that any time there is a normal force, there is, in fact, a friction force present. Because a normal force implies that surfaces are in contact, and when surfaces are in contact, they interact through the normal force, but I'm at least vaguely aware at this point that there's also a sliding interaction between them known as the friction force. In the case of the cart, though, it's very complicated for me to think about because the cart has an axle that goes through some sort of um, uh, some sort of hardware that's mounted to the cart and there's friction in there, which is why I, I grease it in and it rotates around and there's friction between the wheel of the cart and the ground and all sorts of complicated things going on. Well, that's true. And perhaps there's some analysis where I would like to know the inner nature of the motion of the axle, but in that case, I should be drawing a free body diagram for the axle, not for the cart as a whole. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of that retarding influence of everything that's going on in the mechanics of how the cart rolls and generalize it as a friction force that opposes the motion. I'm not going to think deeply about what's going on in terms of the, the axle turns this way and that way and how the forces go, because I know that in general, the influence of all of that muckery inside the cart is that it opposes the motion of the cart. And so I draw a force directed uh, contrary to the motion to the left here, and I label it with a lowercase f, which is my symbol for friction forces. And I write friction on the cart because it's going to turn out this is not the only friction force that's going to appear in my analysis. So just like I have to be careful with the fact that there are multiple weights in the problem, I'll have to be careful that there are multiple friction forces. I did the same thing, by the way, with the normal force, that the normal force has a subscript C because it's the normal force exerting on the cart and there are other objects to consider. So now I have a situation where I've drawn all of the forces that influence the motion of the cart. Notice that I have a force pointing in every direction. That is a complete coincidence. I have drawn these forces as they are on this free body diagram because they are the influences that actually affect the motion of the cart. Uh, it is a very, very bad habit to get into uh, with that I, I guess to a certain extent I sympathize with that you draw a free body diagram for some situation that you're solving, and all of a sudden you look and one side of your free body diagram doesn't have any forces at all on it. You think, there's got to be something, there must be something uh, that is in that other direction. And so you invent a force just because for an aesthetic reason of your free body diagram. And that is a very dangerous thing to do. I have drawn only those forces that act on the cart in the directions that they act, and I should stop there because any other imaginings that I have are not physical.
So they have no business being on my free body diagram. So in principle, what I could do now is I could write Newton's second law for the cart and begin an analysis of the cart's motion. But I'm more interested in drawing the free body diagrams today. And so what I'll do instead is I'll draw a free body diagram now for the horse. So I do the same that I did for the cart, and I draw a small box here that represents the horse. And I'll label it H so I can tell the difference between the two free body diagrams. And now I can go through the analysis a bit faster because it turns out, or it seems, that the analysis of the horse is very similar to the analysis of the cart. For example, does the horse have a weight? Yes. And so I'll draw an arrow on my horse free body diagram directed downward, and I'll label it MH times G, the mass of the horse, times the acceleration due to gravity the weight of the horse directed downward. Again, being careful the, you, to use the mass of the horse uh, to distinguish from the mass of the cart. Now, is anybody pushing or pulling on the horse? Well, just as the horse pulled on the cart, the cart is pulling backward on the horse. In order to get that, I might have to imagine myself in the horse's position. A horse with no cart walks forward easily and is probably quite content, but a horse that is burdened by a cart feels the cart dragging behind. And so on my free body diagram, I will draw a force directed to the left that represents the influence of the cart pulling backward on the horse, and I'll label it F sub C, the force that the cart exerts on the horse. Again, I don't know the inner nature or the fundamental nature, I suppose I should say, of that force exerted by the cart. I just know that it exists. So, um, so I include that influence directed to the left there. Now, uh, are there any surfaces in contact? Sure, the horse is standing on the road, and so there's a normal force of the, of the, the road pushing upward on the horse. Do not concern yourself with the fact that the horse has four hooves just like you didn't concern yourself with the fact that the cart has two wheels in principle, um, you can take that total influence upward as simply the sum of the influence of all four hooves. I'll simply draw it upward and call it the normal force acting on the horse, again distinguishing from the normal force acting on the cart. If there is a normal force, there's likely to be a friction force, and indeed I expect that a friction force exists in this context because I asked the question, how on earth can the horse move forward? It might surprise you at first to see me draw the friction force directed to the right in the direction that the horse goes. This is because people get it in their head that the friction force is always in opposition of the motion, in some sense that friction is bad. It's true that very often friction force, and we'll discuss the friction force in more detail later, but it's true, very often, that the friction force will act to retard motion to remove motion from physical system. Very often we're trying to find clever mechanical ways to eliminate friction from the system. Well, there are also cases where the friction is the cause of motion. And here, indeed, it's true. It's very simple to understand if I focus my attention on the hoof of the horse and try to consider how is it that the horse can propel itself forward. Indeed, here, giving the lecture, how is it that I can propel myself forward? Well, here's my foot in contact with the floor, and if I want to propel myself forward the way that I go about that, and you don't put much thought into this because you've been walking for most of your lives, and so it's sort of an automatic process now, but thinking about it, what I do is I push backward on the floor. And it's a little trick of Newton's third law that if I push backward on the floor, the floor pushes forward on me. And the nature of that force is a frictional force. So the frictional force that I would draw on my free body diagram, but for me here in the front of the room, is not the friction force that I exert backward on the floor, but in fact the friction force that the floor exerts forward on me. And so here on my free body diagram, I've drawn the friction force exerted on the horse, and I've drawn it to the right. This is the, the force that ultimately will explain how it is that the, force can, that the horse can propel the whole work forward, uh, which is really the whole point. Uh, so there, that free body diagram is now complete. It also has the same symmetry. We see that there's a, lot, there's a lot of similarity between the free body diagram for the cart and the free body diagram for the horse. Of particular interest to me is that in the middle I have the force exerted by the horse on the cart and the force of the cart exerted uh, one upon the other here. They are what is known as an action-reaction pair, the action of one object upon, upon the other. When we discussed the third law, I was talking about a collision between myself and a, uh, perhaps a small student, and that when that collision takes place, the forces are equal and opposite. Well, that's rather dramatic. Here in this case, when a horse pulls on a cart, they exert forces one upon the other, which are in fact equal and opposite, action-reaction pairs, according to Newton's third law. Now remember I said, that I'm considering in this uh, situation 
only the case that the acceleration of the horse and the acceleration of the cart are the same, which means I can draw a free body diagram for the cart and the horse together as one object. Just as for the cart, I drew a free body diagram for the wheels and the cart as one object, uh, or the wheels and the body of the cart as one object. So here I'll draw a box and I'll label it CH, cart horse. I draw it slightly larger just so I can get the text in there. And now I consider what are the forces that affect the motion of that system together? Well, naturally it has a weight and I'll call that MG directed downward. You would not be surprised that the weight of the cart horse system simply the sum of the weights of the cart and the horse together. That's rather obvious uh, reasoning there. Uh, anybody pushing or pulling on the cart? No! The pushing and pulling, you see, there would be pushing and pulling if I had another person standing over here with a rope attached to the horse, or if I had somebody back here pushing on the cart. There are no other external forces acting on the cart uh, horse system whose nature I don't uh, fundamentally understand. And so I don't have any capital H forces to add to this. However, are there any surfaces in contact? Yes, the whole works, the cart and the horse together, sitting on the road, there's a normal force directed upward. That normal force, you would not be surprised, just like the weight is the sum of the normal forces. That is a little bit less clear, uh, but will become more clear when I do a Newton's second law analysis of the system. Are there any friction forces? You'll find yourself very often in problem solving, drawing situations where there's only one friction force acting. But in this situation, there are two friction forces, one on each of the two free body diagrams that I've just drawn. It is absolutely okay if you have multiple frictions on one free body diagram. There are no such rules limiting what forces in, in what direction. The only rule there is for free body diagrams is that you draw only those forces that act on the system whose interest or you have interest in solving the motion for. So I'm going to draw the friction force that retards the motion, which acts on the cart, but now that the cart is pulled up part of the cart horse, horse system, they're together as one. So the force exerted on the cart, uh, friction force exerted on the cart backwards is included on this free body diagram. What will propel the whole works forward? Well, it's that friction force that acts on the horse, directed to the right, which provides for that acceleration. And so I draw that friction force here. And so I have my free body diagram for the two together. So I'm already getting quite good at analyzing um, the system and drawing appropriate free body diagrams. The whole point of drawing the free body diagram is so that I can get a better understanding of the left-hand side of Newton's second law. So it becomes possible for me to um, write the sum of all of the forces. Well, a little problem that I have here with my free body diagrams is that the forces point in all sorts of different directions. I have forces that point horizontally and forces that point vertically, and you can easily imagine. If a more uh, sophisticated instance, I might have forces that point at angles and things that I would have to deal with, and we will certainly deal with that particular problem. But I want to uh, make it clear that this, <coughs> pardon me, I want to make it clear that this Newton's second law here is a vector law. It says that the vector sum of forces is equal to, or is in proportion, I guess you should say it this way, that the acceleration, which is a vector, is proportional to the force, which is a vector. In order for any two vectors to be equal to each other, their components must be equal. So it must be true for Newton's second law that if I can write that the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, that should be true in the x components, and that should be true in the y components or in whatever coordinate system I happen to be using here, because everything is up and down, left and right, it makes sense to use the Cartesian coordinates. So what I'm impressing upon you is this, I can write Newton's second law as the sum of the forces that act along the x-axis is equal to the mass times the acceleration along the x-axis. Notice that I didn't write any harpoons on that, because when I'm looking at just the x-axis components, it stops being... Um, it stops being really a vector equation and becomes an algebraic equation because positive forces are forces that point in the positive direction and negative forces are forces that point in the negative direction. It ceases to be two-dimensional, quite obviously. And I can also write, of course, that the sum of all the forces that act along the y-axis is equal to the mass times the acceleration along the y-axis. And that's what I want to first consider. The net force that acts vertically on my free body diagram. I consider it first because it is the simplest to analyze. Look at our first free body diagram for the cart here and consider only the vertical forces. Because of, um, of Newton's second law being a linear vector law, I can ignore the horizontal forces, simply look at the vertical forces because they are in the in independent, linearly independent of each other. So I have the normal force NC directed upward and the weight MCG directed downward. 
let's say that the normal, that upward is the positive direction. So NC is a positive force and MCG going downward is a negative force. What Newton's second law tells me is that the sum of these forces, the vector addition of these forces, will be equal to the mass times the acceleration vertically. But hang on, there is no vertical acceleration in this problem. It's not a magical situation with the cart and the horse. The cart and the horse will not fly up into the air, nor will they burrow down into the ground. So the y-axis acceleration of this system is in fact equal to zero. The y-axis acceleration of the system is in fact equal to zero. So what that means is that the normal force upward plus the negative force downward must be equal to zero. That means the normal force upward minus the weight downward must be equal to zero. And that means that the normal force upward must, in this case, be equal to the weight. And that makes sense. Because how hard does the ground have to push upward on the cart in order to prevent it from accelerating vertically? The answer to that question is obviously it has to push upward with a force equal to the weight of the cart. It has to support the weight of the cart. So nothing terribly interesting is going on vertically because the normal force upward is equal to the weight downward. That doesn't happen all the time. I stress that because it happens often. And careless physics students go on from here saying, oh, the normal force is equal to the weight, the normal force is equal to the weight, the normal force is equal to the weight. It will take no time at all before I expose you to problems where the normal force is not, in fact, equal to the weight. So it would be a terrible habit to get into. Uh, just to quick give an example, imagine that, <laughs> this is, would be very absurd, but imagine that the cart and horse are on a giant elevator. This elevator accelerates upward. When the elevator accelerates upward, the normal force cannot be equal to the weight. Because if the normal force were equal to the weight, the net force would be equal to zero and the acceleration would be unaccounted for. So in that situation, the elevator accelerates upward. It'll turn out that the normal force, in fact, will be greater than the weight, uh, as we'll see. So that's the, the relationship of the normal force here. And I see on the horse free body diagram exactly the same situation. The normal force directed upward would be equal to the weight downward. And for the cart and the horse together, the total no normal force upward would be equal to the total normal force downward. It's a rather obvious uh, consequence of that. So <clears throat> the vertical, not so interesting in the analysis. Not so interesting, not so helpful. The horizontal uh, forces, though, the forces where I write the sum of the forces along the x-axis equal to the mass times the x-axis acceleration, these are, in fact, interesting. For the cart, let me apply Newton's second law. The sum of all the forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Taking the right to be the positive direction and not considering vertical forces at all, only horizontal forces, the force of the horse is a positive force. The friction force that opposes the cart, Fc, is a negative force. So when I write the sum of the forces, I'll write the... The sum of the forces is the force of the horse plus the negative friction force, Fc. So Fh minus Fc is equal to, you have to be careful, to put the appropriate mass in a Newton's second law. I'm describing, I'm using the free body diagram for the cart. It's the mass of the cart that should appear in the equation multiplied by the acceleration. And so I have an equation now called the equation of motion, which describes the behavior of the cart for all states of motion for all states of motion. Remember that there are four. The cart is at rest. The cart is moving with constant velocity. Those are both cases of acceleration equal to zero. Zero acceleration is constant acceleration, zero. Or the cart has a positive acceleration or the cart has a negative acceleration. This equation of motion derived from Newton's second law after the careful consideration of a free body diagram, this equation of motion tells me everything I need to know. Imagine that the acceleration is zero. I get two states of motion for one. Either the cart is at rest or it's moving at constant speed. Those are both situations where the acceleration is equal to zero. Then FH minus FC is equal to zero, which means FH is equal to FC, which means the influence of the force of the horse forward is equal to the influence of the friction backwards. And since those two influences are equal and opposite, they cancel and we're left with no influence. That describes every state of motion that is constant speed. What about zero? Well, imagine that the horse does not pull on the cart and the horse force is zero. The friction force is then zero and they are equal and opposite, but zero, so it doesn't even matter. So the total influence was gonna be zero anyway. Now, what about positive acceleration? If I have a situation of positive acceleration, if to the right is the positive direction and this thing works the way that I expect it will, that the cart and the horse will go off in the positive direction, the cart having a positive acceleration means that the cart is speeding up to the right. The only way that that can happen is if FH is larger than FC, so that 
the difference on the left-hand side of Newton's second law becomes a positive number. So a positive acceleration. I can get a negative acceleration. Well, hang on a second before I like look at the, I'll look at that in context of also the free body diagram here. That means a horse is pulling harder than the friction force is opposing. Naturally, what will happen is the, the horse will win and the cart will accelerate to the right. Now, for the negative acceleration case, the only way for that to work out is that the force exerted by the cart is larger than the force exerted by the, by the horse, so that the left-hand side of Newton's second law works out to be negative. Well, what does that mean? It means that the horse, on my free body diagram here, you can see that it means that the horse is pulling with some force, but that force is insufficient to counter the friction force of the cart. And so the cart and the horse will be slowing down. If they're moving in the positive direction, then slowing down implies a negative acceleration. It makes sense. And indeed, it's true that if a cart and a horse are moving along at constant velocity and the horse is instructed to slow down, the horse does not suddenly exert a force backward. All the horse does is lets up. The horse reduces its force a bit and allows the friction force to cause the stopping, producing the negative acceleration. Writing Newton's second law along the x-axis for the horse free body diagram gives me a slightly different looking equation. Again, to the right is positive, and so FH, the friction force exerted on the horse at its hooves, is positive and it goes first. By the way, you'll notice that I always I try in all of the algebra that I do to write the positive term first. Um, for whatever reason, aesthetically, I don't like negative signs at the front of my algebra. If I can ever avoid having negative signs at the front of my algebra, I will do that. So I have FH minus FC here. FH minus, oh, sorry, wrong equation. I have FH minus F, ha, wrong equation, but it says the same thing, but just uppercase, lowercase. So I have the friction force exerted on the horse minus the, the force of the cart pulling backward. The analysis is the same. In order to get zero acceleration, these two forces would be equal to each other or zero, and that would result in zero acceleration. But in order for the force for the horse to win out and produce positive acceleration, the friction force at the hooves would have to be greater than the force of the cart pulling backward. The horse has to win that battle in order to provide constant acceleration. The horse checks up, and that friction force FH becomes less, and the cart pulling backward becomes more than, in fact, I would have a situation of negative acceleration and slowing down, again, with right being the positive direction. So now for my third free body diagram, I have uh, Newton's second law applied to the horizontal direction where I have the friction force on the horse directed forward, and I have uh, the friction force on the cart directed backward. And so now I see in my Newton's second law analysis with the friction force on the horse minus the friction force on the cart, that's my Newton's second law, is equal to the mass times acceleration. I see these two friction forces in competition, the one with the other. If they are equal, then I have a state of motion with zero acceleration, that is constant velocity, or at rest if those two friction forces are equal. In order to have a positive acceleration, the horse's friction force has to win over the cart's friction force in order to get a positive result from the left-hand side of Newton's second law in this analysis. And in order to get a negative acceleration, the cart's friction force has to be greater with the force on the horse being lesser. And then I get a negative acceleration from the left-hand side of Newton's second law. Uh, and so I see uh, where this careful analysis gets me. Now, the really important thing here is that physics is, well, an important aspect of this is that physics is not about carts and horses. It's important to appreciate what I've done here. What I've done is I have looked at a physical situation and made arguments about what it is that I'd like to understand about it. I thought about what details are important, right? So I described the system quite carefully, drawing a diagram and getting a feel for it. And then I draw free body diagrams so that I can understand the nature of the forces that affect the motion of the object so that I can apply Newton's second law. And once I write Newton's second law for both coordinate directions, then I look at that equation of motion and appreciating the fact that it gives me all of the information that I can know about the behavior of the system, I then analyze and think about what the equation says about the motion. And in principle, the final part there is I get some numbers together and make some calculations about what is possible. Mm -hmm.